why we haven't made more progress despite that. But it's, it's significant and things are getting a little bit better in terms of the international attention to this issue from the most serious international law bodies. International Criminal Court, same thing. After the expert panel um, said that, you know, we're going to take cognizance of these, these companies active in the Congo, which is, by the way, the same thing the UN did in the apartheid era. It actually had a list of companies, it named names to name and change the companies. The Security Council did this earlier this century as well. Um, after they did that, the International Criminal Court's prosecutor, Ocampo, said, and you know what else? I'll prosecute the individual corporate executives that are involved in this trade if they don't reform their practices. That gets the company's attention. And all of these form the kind of context in which companies are now taking this seriously. It's a result of a multi-pronged approach that has different leverage points on it. Um, the OECD guidelines themselves are worth mentioning. The OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, is sort of the rich countries club of the world. It includes most of you know, the Western European countries, Japan, the US, and so forth. Um, and so they have disproportionate power. And the guidelines and their rules and regulations apply not just to the activities within those rich countries, but they apply to the activities of the multinationals wherever they go in the world. And so the OECD guidelines for multinationals actually require companies, you now it's supposedly voluntary, but you know, if you have a transparent world and people are watching, people expect you to keep your commitments. They require companies to comply with human rights. And so those guidelines have then been reinforced, strengthened lately, just in, at the end of last year, with new dil due diligence guidelines for companies operating in conflict areas. And so, you know, I've been involved in that process and in the UN's conflict sensitive guidelines process. These are soft law mechanisms to complement the hard law that we're seeing from the Security Council or from the International Criminal Court happening at the, at the international level. You also have regional organizations, you know, like the African Human Rights System taking cognizance of these issues more and more, considering uh, possible claims and so forth. And then at the, at the national level, <clears throat> you actually have some of the most exciting things going on, including the, the law that we saw, the Dodd-Frank legislation, 1502. There's also the Alien Tort Claims Act, I mentioned that. That has been a very strong mechanism to hold a lot of companies liable, in a sense. Um, there hasn't been a successful court case, because what's happened is a lot of the companies have settled prior to the, the actual uh, you know, litigation going to court. But there have been multi-million dollar settlements in various industries now using that mechanism. Now something you may want to be aware of is that that mechanism took a very serious blow last September in a case called the Keobel case, which was a Second Circuit decision. Very ironic because the Second Circuit had had um, two or three precedents that were earlier um, just really key to the, the development of this jurisprudence over the last few decades. But the Second Circuit in Keobel in September, um, the majority there said that um, that co companies cannot even have human rights obligations. So if that decision stands, at least in that circuit, we have a very serious problem with accountability, that accountability mechanism. Um, now the other circuits still are pursuing you know, these cases. Um, and you know, I think that I think the case is just completely uh, wrongly decided. It was decided more on the basis of ideology than law, an ideology of pro-market laissez-faire economics. That really reminds me of the, the Lochner era uh, in the early part of the 20th century, where judges just imposed a free market ideology that didn't take into account realities. But the ACTA cases, the Alien Tort Claims Act, remain a significant uh, potential mechanism of accountability, at least in the other circuits, for the time being. And I hope that they will remain uh, relevant, um, you know, in, even in the Second Circuit, if this case is overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. What's interesting is that those cases, the ACTA cases, draw on the international criminal law jurisprudence. And so the ICCs, the International Criminal Courts Law cases, they actually draw on that, the statutes, standards for war crimes and crimes against humanity, which some of these are. If you use rape as a war crime, that's a crime against humanity if it's done on a systematic basis. And so, you know, the, the interaction between these areas of law is something else that's interesting and you might want to be aware of. International criminal law, is influenced by the law of war and influencing the vice versa as well, and international human rights law. We're seeing a very interesting dynamic between these systems that, again, is starting to hold people accountable in new ways. Um, 
There's also, I should mention, at the, at the global level, the UN Framework for Business and Human Rights, which is an initiative that's come up in the last few years. But, but about 2008, uh, Professor John Ruggie of Harvard came up with a tripartite framework that talks about the state duty to protect, the corporate duty to respect human rights, and then the need for remedies. I won't go into this in more detail, but there are new guiding principles that are relevant to this area that do talk about conflict minerals that you may want to check out. They're probably going to be approved by the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva uh, in the meeting that's, that's ongoing. So I expect those will be approved in, a, in the next month or two. Um, if you were more interested in that, we just had an event at the Rock Center for Corporate Governance. It's up on the website of the Rock Center, and you can watch, uh, watch that if you're interested in more details on that. We also are seeing, um, you know, you've heard a little bit about the intergovernmental progress. The countries of the Great Lakes region, um, the ICGLR, the 11 African nations there, are working with their own in-country certification system. Now, why is this important? It's important even though, you know, frankly, there are, there are a lot of issues because there, there are a number of corrupt governments in, involved in that initiative. Um, but if they take it seriously, and if NGOs, like enough, continue to monitor it, this can play a vital role. I think it's very important because, you know, the, the comments we heard earlier today about self-regulation being inadequate are very well taken. Self-regulation is an important part of the process, but it only works when it's in the shadow of the law. In other words, there has to be a hard law incentive for people to self-regulate. Otherwise, the tendency is to just not do what you're supposed to do. And so it's this dynamic between the hard law mechanisms like the International Criminal Court, like the Security Council, like the Alien Tort Claims Act, and then the soft law mechanisms, like the OECD guidelines, like the UN Global Compact, which requires its thousands of members to commit to human rights, and then the self-regulation. Because ultimately, self-regulation is indispensably important. You can't just have these abstract principles from the hard law and soft law. You've got to actually reduce it to supply chain management. You've got to insert these um, obligations into management systems, the due diligence processes, the policies and procedures of the company. And that's where these guiding principles of the UN Special Representative for Human Rights and Business come into play, because they go down to the next level to say companies must do some basic things. They have to have a human rights policy. You know, they have to have implementation procedures, including human rights impact assessments. So in other words, they do what we would do. If we're going to be responsible citizens with not only rights but duties, we have to consider how our actions affect other people that we're involved with. And so you have to do a human rights impact assessment. It doesn't have to be a lot of bureaucratic red tape. It just needs to be simple taking cognizance about how your actions are going to affect others. Now this has been done in the environmental area for decades, EIAs, environmental impact assessments. So HRIAs, human rights impact assessments, are an important part of that. The third element after policies and HRIAs that this framework requires is um, a monitoring mechanism. So of course you've got to have you know, checkpoints as to whether you're doing what you're saying. And this is not anything new for companies. Nokia had it, GE companies, all the major multinationals have operational reviews, management systems, audit processes. What we're asking them to do, what you're asking them to do, is now just plug into your standard processes what they've been doing. And that's what's happened. GE, one of the largest companies in the world, 300,000 plus employees, it has incredibly rigorous operational reviews. It's got its own internal audits. And so what you need to do is have them add conflict minerals. And believe me, GE has also been a leader in this area. GE, Ford from the automotive industry, they're on board. You know, Their systems are not perfect yet. They're learning as they're going, but they are committed to try to avoid conflict minerals in the supply chain. So that's a good thing. And if they take, believe me, if GE commits to something, it had some problems historically. You know, it was involved in the, in the defense scandals and so forth of, of the 70s. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act was then born after that. But now GE gets it, and they actually will fire people who don't act with integrity. And they've got audit systems. Their auditing function is not only the little accountant green cap, they actually take this so seriously that it's a crucible, a generator of leadership. 